Well, I'd like to welcome everyone here again today for another session, our last, last session, last great day. That's what we want to talk about today, but we've got a lot of wood to chop today, so uh, we got to get at it. Well, let's have a word of prayer and ask for some guidance because this is what we need, and uh, Ask for the Spirit to be with us. Father in heaven, we thank you again for this day, the last great day of this feast, in which all the promises are going to come to pass. And we ask that you be with us today. And again, we ask that you would rightly divide the word for us. And may the Spirit that inspired it help us to understand we ask that you be with us now, cleanse our hearts and minds, that your spirit can truly work in and through us. May the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight. We pray in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. So, the question that the disciples asked when Yeshua was about to be taken up into heaven, does anyone remember what that question was? Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? This, is, this, in their minds, was the culmination of all the lost empire that was given to Adam and Eve at the beginning. Now, they looked at things a little bit differently. They thought when when the kingdom would restore to Israel, then they would be judges and they would rule over all the people and they would convert the whole world and all the nations would flood into Israel and they would rule over the Romans and, and all of this. This is what was in their minds. It's no coincidence that the mentality, for the most part, with the people that I am acquainted with is their concept of the restoration of the kingdom is much like that of the Jews and the disciples of at the time of Yeshua. Is that they would be able to rule over the nations and they would be the Torah police and they would be able to govern and whip them into shape uh, when Yeshua sets up his kingdom. But this could not be farther from the reality of it because the restoration of the kingdom to Israel is not until the last great day. If you are going to have a, a festival calendar which encompasses the pinnacle events of the plan of salvation, if you had one of the festivals contained within that revelation of the plan of salvation that was called the last great day, I wonder if it makes any sense that the last great day would be the culmination of the plan of salvation. When the kingdom is actually restored to its original owners on the last great day. Now, does that make too much sense to accept it? Uh, to a lot of people, it actually does. But the last great day would be the last great day of the plan of salvation. That's when the ultimate jubilee will happen, when the kingdom will be given back to those that rightfully own it. And that's when the meek shall inherit the earth. That's the kingdom restored to God's people. That will not happen at the second coming. According to the book of Revelation, this will happen at the end of the millennium. This is what we're going to be looking at, but there's several things that are going to have to happen before that happens, and that's what we want to look at. Yesterday, we were looking at uh, the concept of what happens when Yeshua returns, and we didn't quite get finished that. We want to really nail that down because there is so much confusion on what is actually going to happen when Yeshua returns. So we want to 
look deeper into that so we can see that clearly. We're going to pick it up in Revelation 19, 6 through 9. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. So it's become very obvious at this point in history that the Lord God is taking the reins of control. This is what happens. Let us rejoice, or let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage supper of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. So, this is what we talked a little bit about yesterday the marriage supper of the Lamb. If this is correct, and I want to go to the board, I'll be doing this on and off as usual. If the marriage supper of the Lamb comes when Yeshua returns, where is he going? We looked at the idea yesterday that there's no question if we follow Yeshua through the Gospels, especially in the book of John, he talked about the kingdom of heaven quite a bit. And those that do the will of God will enter the kingdom of heaven. When are they going to do that? They're going to do that at the second coming. We laid that out uh, very clearly. They're going to do that at the second coming. So if the second coming and the deliverance is at Passover, and we're using the first exodus as a pattern for the second exodus, along with all of Daniel and Revelation, it looks very clear that the deliverance of God's people will happen at Passover. Well, we know what happens at Passover. There's a certain amount of fleeing that's going on. Yeshua told us about that, that these people will be fleeing. Uh, the earth will be reduced to uh, it'll be void, and we're going to look at that, what kind of a situation that the earth is going to be uh, reduced to at the time of the second coming. Talked a little bit about that yesterday. So they will not, these people here, the righteous, the 144,000 who will be alive that have made themselves ready, this is what we just read, that they will be unable to celebrate the Passover at that time, and they will celebrate it in the kingdom at the Father's house, and it is the ultimate marriage supper of the Lamb, of which, when the disciples celebrated it with him the last time, he said that he, it would not be fulfilled until the kingdom of God. And this is what he was talking about. So the ultimate marriage supper of the Lamb, the marriage supper of the Lamb, which the disciples celebrated was a type of the marriage supper of the Lamb that will be celebrated in the kingdom. And as we've seen, Noah actually could not celebrate the Passover when the flood came and when he was preparing the ark for a trip and he became in contact with Methuselah's body because he was responsible. And we know that he died in the year of the flood, the first part of the year of the flood. Noah wouldn't have been able to celebrate the Passover. And it was in the second month um, that when he was sealed in the side, inside of the ark. And what is the ark, really? It's God's protecting um, place where his sanctuary is. Noah was protected into the sanctuary. Where are these going? They're going to the ultimate sanctuary in the kingdom of God. And we saw this in Revelation chapter 6 and 7. Very clearly, they end up in the Father's house. And this is what Yeshua told all of us in um, John chapter 13 and 14. He said, I'm going to the Father's house, but you will follow me afterwards. When? He was talking about when he would return. So they're going to the Father's house. Contrary to a lot of popular belief, they, Yeshua is not setting up his kingdom here on earth. He's taking the righteous who died in Yeshua, as Paul talks about in 1 Thessalonians, and those are, who are alive at his coming. He's taking them to the Father's house. And this is where the marriage supper of the Lamb 
And as I mentioned yesterday, this has led many people that are starting to see this now. They're saying, well, you know, maybe the thousand years isn't going to be all on earth. Some of it's going to be in heaven. So I find it interesting that people are having to change their story all the way along because more truth is coming out. So the idea here is, well, some are changing. He's going to be on earth for some times and will be in heaven, but it's only going to be a certain group that goes to heaven. And it's just, it, it's starting to become confusion when you start to listen to some of these things. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. Now, as I mentioned here, what he uh, was saying here in Luke, he said, When the hour had come, he sat down with the twelve apostles. This is his last Passover here on earth. And he said, then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have a desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it, the Passover, until it, the Passover, is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Yeshua talked about the kingdom of God. And when he talked about the kingdom of God, he was not referring to the kingdom of the earth. Uh, he was talking about where his father was. So the fulfillment of Passover will actually be in the kingdom of God. And I find it very interesting that according to the Torah, and of course all the feasts were celebrations, so they had meals at all of the festivals, but there is only one special meal uh, in the festivals, and it was called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Well, we understand that the festivals have typology and meaning that go beyond the obvious meaning. But when we start to dissect what these festivals are about, we start to understand why it's the marriage supper of the Lamb. Because there are people that are going to attend that are pure, that are without sin. And there will be no sin in the kingdom of God. So we are... We are a people that are prepared to be in the kingdom of God because we are now without sin. We have been purified by the blood of the Lamb and by the tribulation that we have been through. That's a sanctification process that we're going to be going through and that prepares us for this meal. So we are going to be without sin. That's without leaven. That's the Feast of Unleavened Bread, without leaven. And there will be no leaven around us in the kingdom. So we will be completely uh, without leaven within us and on the outside. We will be ready for that meal. And this is really what the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, is all about. So we go on in Revelation 19, and it says, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. And somebody says, well, wait a minute. This is the second coming of Yeshua, and now you tell me, we just read those verses that went before, and they said that we're celebrating the marriage supper of the Lamb. How can this, how can the second coming happen after the marriage supper of the Lamb? Well, here's how it happens. Because as we've been seeing, and I believe this is one of the major problems that people do not understand when it comes to prophecy. We have been looking at all these prophecies that stack on top of each other. Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 10 through 12. And then we get to the book of Revelation and we have six more prophecies, if you will, that are the forerunner of six second comings in the book of Revelation. Well, we don't have six second comings in the book of Revelation. What we have is six prophecies that give us events that are going to transpire before the second coming. So just as in the book of Daniel, 
as Daniel had Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 10 through 12, all talking about events that would happen during the end of time, during the judgment period, which is what we've been looking at. All these prophecies have to stack on top of each other. That's where we're getting all these time prophecies because we're building, putting more information on. No different when we get to the book of Revelation, we've got the groundwork in the book of Daniel. Now we know how to interpret the book of Revelation. So what we have seen is the culmination, those verses that I just read about the marriage supper of the Lamb, that is the segment prior to this. So now we're looking at what happens. We're going back and illuminating what happens before the marriage supper of the Lamb. I hope you're following this. This is no different. Daniel is quite a bit easier than this because we've got Daniel 7 as a chapter, Daniel 8 as a chapter, and Daniel 10 through 12 as three chapters, but all one revelation. So this is what happens when we get to the book of Revelation. We've got a repeat and enlargement thing going on, but we when we look at it, we've got like three or four chapters all on one segment. It's not divided the same way Daniel uh, chapter 7, which is one revelation, Daniel 8, one revelation, but it's the same revelation. It's just an addition to the prior revelation. We get to the, revela the book of Revelation, and because the chapters are not inspired, and I say that kind of in reverence, but the, the Bible um, people that created the Bible that we have, the chapters were not in there. It was one long dialogue, and so they put those chapter breaks in there, and the chapter breaks in there trip us up many times. But if we would take the book of Revelation, get rid of all the chapter breaks, and start segmenting the different visions, the different segments of the vision. And if we would do that, that's what I've tried to do, if we will do that, then we will see the segments, how they fit on top of each other and give additional information to what we have read before. This is exactly what we have in Revelation 19. We see the culmination of the marriage supper of the Lamb, and it should stop right there. That should be the break, because that's the culmination of what happens at the second coming. He takes us at the second coming to the Father's house. So that's where we go from here. We go to the Father's house, and then we celebrate the marriage supper lamb. That's it. Now, what we're doing here in Revelation 19 is we're backing up a little bit, and we're filling in what happens at the second coming. And it helps us to know how we get there. And this is throughout. We're going to be looking at this. And we're just going to really try and nail that down because this is really important when we get to chapter 20, 21, and 22. We're actually going to see three segments again a repeat and enlargement of what has gone before. If we don't understand this concept in the book of Revelation, we are going to get the story wrong. There is no question about it. And I hope to make that very clear. This is going to open a door to our understanding on how we interp interpret the prophecies, because unless we interpret in a way that reflects how they were given, we won't understand the prophecies. And Satan knows this very well. He does not want us to understand how these prophecies were given and God's method of giving them. So now we go into this verse and we, we see here, Now I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. Brand new segment. This is this part of the story right here. When Yeshua is, has left heaven, and now he is coming back to this planet. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes were a flame of fire, and his head were, on his head were many crowns. 
and he had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is who this is. This is Yeshua himself returning as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the armies of heaven, the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on horses. Now, this is not, this is not human beings. These are angels. These are all the angels. He said, Yeshua said in Matthew 24 and 25, that when he returns, he will be in his glory, in the glory of all the holy angels. These are the host of heaven that are coming with him. And, uh, and so this is the picture that we're seeing here. And they followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should strike the nations, and he shall rule with, er, them with a rod of iron. He, tread, uh, he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God Almighty. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now this is a very interesting, I don't think I have to explain this, it says what it says, and I think it means what it says. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. This is a uh, quite an interesting statement. Out of his mouth, if he's the word of God, the sword of the spirit would be the word of God. And this is what we see here. Uh, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. If we go back to Psalms chapter 2, verses uh, 8 through 8 and 9, we see something very interesting here. Some people have interpreted these verses in Revelation as when Yeshua comes back, it's a bit of a contradiction within the verse itself, but because I find when people want to believe a certain doctrine or a certain idea, I'm always amazed at the gymnastics they can do to land on the exact spot that they need to land on to have their way. And this is the same thing here, but when we reference other verses, we can see what's going on. It says, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Seems to be a, a bit of a contradiction within the verse itself. But if we will go to a cross-reference here, we actually can see what he's saying here in Psalms 2, 8, and 9. This is a conversation in 2, 8, and 9, but it's a conversation that involves the Father and the Son, and I really recommend uh, trying to grapple with Psalms chapter 2. It's actually a parallel of Revelation 19. Ask of me... And I will give you, so a lot of times in the Psalms, and I, I've done this in different places in my Bible, this is a conversation between the Father and the Son. The me here is the Father. Ask of the Father, and I, the Father, give you, the Son, the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. That would be the Son again. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. This is the, the picture that we see revealed in Revelation 19. And, uh, and so this idea that he's coming back and he's going to somehow straighten out the wicked, that is not what's going on here. We can see clearly what is happening. Revelation 19, 17, and 18, Then I saw an angel standing on the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God. And here again, I need to emphasize, that's right here. That's right at the end. So we're doing a repeat and enlargement, and we're, we're being shown what happens when Yeshua returns. Before they go to the Father's house to celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb. Repeat and enlarge is what's going on here. 
that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses and those that sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. Now, I have to ask the question. The all people, that sounds pretty all-inclusive. Would that include the righteous, those that have died in Yeshua, and those that have been... Uh, that are alive in Yeshua? No, because as yesterday we were looking at verses, there are only two groups of people in the time of the end when Yeshua comes, those that have accepted him and those that have not. Those that have died and not accepted Yeshua are not risen at that time. There are only two groups of people alive those that are alive when Yeshua comes that are wicked, and those that are alive when Yeshua comes who are, I believe, to be numbered of the 144,000. And then, as Paul says, that those that have died in Christ will be resurrected and they will meet the Lord in the air. They are not part of this group of people, this all people, which will be all the unrighteous that are living at that time. And it's interesting when it does this, and we looked at other verses um, in uh, Isaiah chapter 24, when it gives a list like this, it starts naming different groups of people. What God is trying to show us is nobody escapes this. That's why the list of people. And um, it doesn't say accountants, and it doesn't say, you know, electricians, and all of these kinds of things because it doesn't have to. The point being, the way God has laid this out, what he's saying is nobody is eclipsed from this picture. Everyone gets their reward when Yeshua comes back. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. I want to make a couple points here, and this is what I said. We've got a lot of wood to chop here because there is so much stuff in these verses. Now, there's this idea that the beast is the papacy. Well, this clearly demonstrates that the beast is not the papacy. The beast cannot be the papacy because at this time, there is no papacy. The papacy has been destroyed by the ten kings that were revealed in Revelation 17. The beast is the system, the world order, that the kings of the earth have surrendered their sovereignty to. And how does that work? Well, we have a little glimpse of that today. The UN, I have, <laughs> it's, it's kind of scary what's going on is the kingdoms of the world, certain kingdoms of the world, are surrendering their sovereignty to the UN system. That's what we have in the time of the end. And we're seeing that develop now. Is the kings of the earth have their order, this world order that they have bought into, and they surrender their sovereignty, and now the world system dictates what the kings are to do. And interestingly enough, in Revelation 17, is there's a harlot that sits on the beast, which is made up of the kings of the earth. And we've gone through that. If you haven't seen those videos just a few days ago, if you haven't seen that, I would recommend uh, that you go back and see that. So this beast uh, is still alive when Yeshua comes back. And it's not talking about the papacy, nor can it be because the papacy has been destroyed by the kings, by the ten kings of the earth at that time. You could actually put, and I saw the beast, and then in parentheses, the kings of the earth. Because the beast is the amalgamation of the kings of the earth. And we saw this in Revelation 13. It has seven heads which would be the European Union, those that are in control of the European Union. It also has the lion, the bear, and the leopard. And we went through this in, in great detail the other day. So this is, this is what's going on here. And uh, it says, 
they're gathered together to make war against him. Who? Yeshua. And this is what it says in Revelation 17, 12, verse 18. And we're going we're gonna to look at that because, um, you know, we've spoken briefly about it. But we want to nail these things down to take the, the mystery out of it. <clears throat> so we're going to start in Revelation 17, uh, 12 through 18. And the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who receive no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. So these are the kings that make up the New World Order system uh, that the beast is. And I would say that if it's not the UN, the UN is definitely the forerunner of this beast. It's a pulling together of the major powers, and, and I don't actually see any change in the UN because the same kingdoms that we see today that are the permanent members of the UN, these are going to be the ones that are in control of this power. So the UN, in my mind, um, the, at least the structure of the UN is going through all the way to the end. And this is how I know we're getting close because we have the system in place and these kings of the earth that are alive, the lion, the bear, and the leopard, and the European Union are giving today their authority to the beast. They're handing their sovereignty to the beast and the beast is going to dictate uh, world policy and we see that. We see that. It's no, no mystery. We see that with the health things that are going on and different aspects of that. <clears throat> Immigration is another thing. The UN is actually dictating that they have to take in all these different uh, immigrants, and this is where the problems are coming from, and this is what we see in the world today. So they are giving, even today, their sovereignty. It goes on to say, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who receive no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast, their sovereignty. These will make war with the lamb, and the lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords, king of kings. This is exactly what we read here. So these ten kings, ultimately, when Yeshua returns... They will make war with the Lamb. A little preview of what's going to happen when Yeshua shows up. And it says, goes on to say, and he said in verse 15, And he said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, nations, and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these are the ten kings that make up the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked and eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman which you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. And of course that was revealed earlier on. The woman who sits on many waters many kingdoms and the kings of the earth give their authority to the beast and the harlot rules over that. We saw that it's all through prophecy in the little horn showing up here and there and we've already looked at that so we don't want to get into that. But this is what we see here is the papacy is destroyed prior to the second coming so the beast cannot be because the beast is alive in the ten kings in the time of the end. The beast moves forward once the papacy is destroyed, and this proves that fact. So then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence. So these are the two beasts of Revelation 13, demonstrating again that at the second coming, the beast is alive at the second coming, and the beast is made up of the ten kings. But it also says 
that the false prophet who works signs in his presence. Well, who's the false prophet? That's the second beast of Revelation 13 that causes all the people within its jurisdiction, where it rose out of the earth, it, within his jurisdiction, he causes all those to worship the first beast. So here in the time when Yeshua returns, we have the world order system, and we have the second beast as well being the false prophet. And why is it called the false prophet? Very interesting. We saw this earlier yesterday. But this calls that second beast the false prophet. How do we know it's the second beast? Because in Revelation 13, it says that he worked these signs in his presence, even causing fire to come down in the sight of men to deceive those who dwell on the earth. So at that time, the whole system comes unglued because Yeshua is showing up. So the beast has captured that system, and with him the false prophet, that system who works signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. So the verses that lead up to this is saying that when Yeshua returns, all people that are not righteous at that time, all those people that have accepted the mark of the beast, and there's only going to be two groups at that time, I, guess I say again, there's going to be righteous and there's going to be wicked. But at this time in earth's history, all the wicked will have accepted the mark of the beast. They will be falling in line with the, either the beast power or the false prophet or the second beast. So the whole world will be captivated by this, and that whole world system will be cast into the lake of fire, uh, burning with brimstone. But all the people at that time that are alive will be consumed in that destruction. This is very clear in uh, Revelation 19. The idea that Yeshua is setting up his kingdom at this time on this planet uh, is just far from what it says. And in, then it goes on to finish up here in this chapter about the second coming, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. This word, the rest, the rest, that's the remnant. That's the same word when God's people flee into the wilderness, and, it's, and it talks about the remnant. It's the same thing. Those that are alive of God's people, we know what happens to them. That's the remainder. That's all that's left. Well, this is the same terminology. So all the wicked people, no one escapes this. Just in case in the captains and the chief men, the slave and the free and all, we went through that list. Then we go through the world system list, the beast and the false prophet. And then it says, then the rest. So just in case somebody thinks there's other people left, it says the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. No one escapes the destruction at the second coming. You are either lost or you have been taken up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. This is what the word says. And somebody may say, well, whoa, 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 wait a minute, because in, in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel, that, it doesn't say that. It's, you know, Yeshua's coming back. He's gonna, we're going to have a rebuilt temple. We're going to start sacrificing again. This is what we don't get, is the book of Revelation has the end of the story. The prophets had bits and pieces of the plan of salvation, but no prophet had the complete understanding. So God would give them pictures and of this. They were incomplete understandings. And so what people are doing today, they're, make, they're taking the incomplete understanding, and, and in reverence I say this, the incomplete understanding of what Isaiah had, the incomplete understanding of what Ezekiel had, 
the incomplete understanding of what even Daniel had. And they're taking those incomplete understandings and isolating them and say, this is what's going to happen. If we don't build everything and put everything together and look at the additional information in the prophets, especially Daniel and Revelation, because that's what Yeshua said in answer to the question, what is the sign of your coming in the end of the age? He didn't point us to Jeremiah. He didn't point us to Ezekiel. He pointed us to Daniel. And when Daniel is understood, you can see that it's the foundation of the book of Revelation. So Yeshua actually points us to two books at the time of his coming, the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. And that doesn't mean that, that Jeremiah and Ezekiel and, and Isaiah didn't have glimpses of this, but they didn't have the bigger picture uh, that Yeshua was talking about, the sign of his coming and the end of the age. We are seeing events right here, right now, at the second coming of Yeshua. All through the book of Revelation, we see judgment. And this is what this is all about. And uh, we see this clearly when we start to understand how this book is put together uh, for us to see. I want to look at some other things in some of these other prophets and show the, the glimpses they saw at the second coming of Yeshua. And I say again, they are just glimpses. It's not detailed uh, the way the book of Revelation is. Isaiah, speaking of the second coming. Isaiah 26, 19 through 21. Your dead shall live together with my dead body. They shall arise. Right here. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust, for your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out her dead. Question, is it casting out all the dead? No, it doesn't say that. It's just saying that some people are going to rise. The details are in the book of Revelation. We've got two resurrections in the book of Revelation. This is what John talked about in John chapter 5. He talks about a resurrection of the just and the resurrection of the unjust. And if we isolate chapter 5 of John, it looks like Yeshua was referring that both resurrections would happen at the same time. But when we get to the book of Revelation, we can see that there are two resurrections. There's no question that Yeshua had that figured out. But it's not until we get to the book of Revelation, which is a revelation of Yeshua, the Messiah, he explains in the book of Revelation that there are two resurrections, but they're 1,000 years apart. You cannot see this in the book of John. This is why it's not until we get to the book of Revelation that we actually see, yes, there are two resurrections. We see this exact same picture in the book of Daniel, chapter 12 talks about a resurrection of the righteous and the wicked, but it doesn't show a separation there of a thousand years. So this is what I'm saying. The prophets that have gone before John in the book of Revelation, they saw glimpses, but they didn't see the details. So when we make the glimpses the final authority on what's going to happen in the future, we're going to go wrong. We need the full extent of the revelation. And God through time has revealed more and more and more light on the plan of salvation. And it's not till we get to the last chapter of the book that we see the culmination of the plan of salvation. And this is where we're trying to get to today with all the wood that we're going to chop. We'll keep going. So here we say, here he says that the earth will cast out its dead. This is talking about the righteous now, because Isaiah is saying that he's going to be included in this. Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is past. This is talking about the second coming, the one riding on the white horse. No question. 
For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will also disclose her blood and no more cover her slain. You know, I find this, and we're going to see this again, very interesting. Yeah, the question came up yesterday, well, what about the two witnesses? And, you know, they lied in the streets of Jerusalem for three days and nobody wanted to bury them. Isn't this a just reward for those that gloried in the death of the two witnesses that didn't allow them to be buried because they wanted to look at their dead bodies? But then it says they were taken up to heaven and fear came upon them. You know, God is going to give people, everyone, exactly what they've earned. And it says here that they will no more cover her slain. Jeremiah tells us, For behold, I begin to bring calamity on the city which is called by my name. Which city is that? Jerusalem, God's city of peace. And in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, we see where that city is. It's not on this earth. It's the city in heaven, which the one on this earth was supposed to be a type but instead being a city of peace, which we're looking at even today, instead of being the city of peace, Satan has turned it around and flipped it on its head, and it's become a city of war. And it has been a city of war through the ages because Satan is trying to destroy what God has been trying to do. So he's going to bring uh, calamity on the city, which is called by his name. This is another point that we need to make here is Jerusalem is going to become the focal point in the time of the end. And as we have been talking about, the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place claiming to be God, uh, this is what Satan is going to do. And God is going to reward all of this because they have turned their back on him. And really, they've turned it back on what his word actually says. So God goes on to say, and should be, uh, which is called by my name, and should you be utterly unpunished. You shall not be unpunished, for I will call for a sword on all the inhabitants of the earth. All the inhabitants of the earth. When has this ever happened? Not yet. Therefore prophesy against them all these words and say to them, the Lord will roar from on high. This sounds a lot like Revelation 19. And utter his voice from his holy habitation. He will roar mightily against his fold. Those that claim. He will give a shout. What does it say? Paul says he will descend with a shout. And this is just, you know, this is what Paul was looking at, obviously. He will give a shout as those who tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. Here again, no one escapes. No time has God roared from on high and included all the inhabitants in this. There are only two groups, those that are saved and those that bear the brunt of what we're looking at. A noise will come to the ends of the earth. No one's escaping here. For the Lord has a controversy with the nations. He will plead his cause with all flesh. He will give those who are wicked to the sword. This is exactly the same picture. He will plead his cause. So that's made people think, okay, well, you know, he's going to come and plead his cause. That's not what it's saying here. He's been pleading his cause. The gospel will go to how much of the world? All the world, and then the end will come. It's during this time that he's pleading his cause with all flesh. But at the time they reject him, this is what happens. Jeremiah 25, 32 tells us, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, disaster shall come from, uh, forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the farthest parts of the earth. And at that day, the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of earth, even to the other end of the earth. Has this ever happened in history? I do not think so. Not that I'm aware of. They shall not be lamented or gathered or buried 
they shall become refuge on the ground. This is what it's talking about here again. They get their just reward uh, for what they've done. Whale shepherds and cries roll about in ashes, you leaders of the flock. For the days of your slaughter and your dispersions are fulfilled. You shall fall like a precious vessel. Now, I don't have a precious vessel. I meant to get one. But they're taught a precious vessel would be something at this time probably made of clay, probably delicate, nicely painted up. And this precious vessel, if you dropped it and it hit a rock, it would shatter in all kinds of pieces. This is the picture that we're seeing. Utter destruction is the picture that we're seeing here. Goes on to say, and the shepherds will have no way to flee. No one escapes, nor the leaders of the flock to escape. A voice of the cry of the shepherds and a wailing of the leaders of the flock will be heard. For the Lord has plundered their pasture. And the peaceful dwellings are cut down because of the fierce anger of the Lord. He has left his lair like a lion, for their land is desolate. For their land is desolate because of the fierceness of the oppressor. And I find this very interesting. Uh, this is the New King James, and I was looking in different translations. It doesn't really bring it out like this. But the oppressor could very well be the abomination of desolation, the destroyer, the ultimate destroyer of anything that is good, uh, and he has brought the land to desolation. And we talked about that yesterday. Uh, unless those days be shortened, all flesh would, uh, would be destroyed. And this is what Yeshua referred to. Satan is going to bring this earth to utter destruction. Um, and there's a reason why God allows that, of course. Jeremiah 4, uh, 23, 27, I beheld the earth. And indeed, it was without form and void, and the heavens had no light. Wow. At this point, at the point of the second coming, the earth is said to be without form and void. That's because when we look at the book of Revelation and see all the destruction that's going on during this time, it will be reduced to the same description as it was in the beginning. If we go to Genesis 1, 1 and 2, we can see here that this without form and void, the exact same terminology is before the creation, before God decorated this planet. This planet will be reduced. If you want to know the end of the story, look at the beginning of the story. This planet will be reduced to pre creation of when God had just basically a rock that had no form to it. The heavens had no light. What does it say in Genesis? And darkness covered the deep. This is reduced at second coming. The earth is reduced. Is it reduced to this because of what God is, does or because of what man does? And Satan was in control of this. I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled, and all the hills moved back and forth. We talked a little bit about this. You know, we talked a little bit about gravity and what gravity does to the oceans, and it's just because the moon's out there. We're talking about the most powerful force in the universe with all the holy angels showing up, the glory of the sun, the glory of the angels, the glory of the Father, all showing up at this planet. You want to believe that the hills are going to move back and forth. We're not talking about the power of the moon moving the tides. We're talking about this earth is going to rip wide open when he shows up. And this is the picture that we see in the prophecies. I beheld, and indeed there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens had fled. I find this very interesting, because in Revelation 19... It talks about men, and it talks about a great feast, and it talks about birds eating. Well, the birds had already fled. It looks like the meal's over by this time. 
you know, it's kind of in jest a little bit, but why mention this? We see it in Revelation, what's actually happened. Now, whether it's actually a figure of speech that the supper of the great God and the birds are going to get their fill, I rather suspect it's probably a figure of speech. Uh, I'm not sure anything's going to survive uh, this um, arrival of Yeshua. Um, but the terminology is very much the same. There is no man because there's no man alive on the planet. Here again, the idea that Yeshua is coming back to set up his kingdom is nowhere to be found if we're rightly dividing the word of truth. There indeed was no man and all the birds of heavens fled away. I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness, a desolate place, and all the cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. This is exactly the story we see in the book of Revelation. We can see that the prophets of old saw glimpses and little sort of pictures of what happened, but it's not until we get to the book of Revelation that we see that this is not actually the end of the story. This is not the culmination of the plan of salvation. The plan of salvation after these verses is still a thousand years away from its culmination. And we see that in the last great day. We're getting there. It says all the cities of the world are broken down. This does not look like to me that Yeshua is setting up a kingdom and then we're going to be converting all these people that never quite got an opportunity to hear what he had to say. It's over when Yeshua returns. In Hebrews, it tells us that. It tells us that he will appear a second time apart from sin, but to salvation. So it's salvation that he brings at the second coming. And that means he's saving those that have uh, decided to serve him in his kingdom. For thus says Jehovah, the whole land shall be desolate, yet I will not make a full end. I love this. And this is perfect because this demonstrates the point I'm trying to make that they did not see the end of the story. They never saw the thousand years. But what this is indicating, it's not over yet. There's still something that's going to happen after this destruction. And we see that. And I don't think I, um, I meant to put these texts in there. And if we get to them, I think this is where I wanted to put some, a few other texts. And we really need to go there because um, this tags onto that. In the book of Isaiah chapter 24. And we read chapter 24 in reference to this. Um, if we go there, chapter 24 is, is absolutely the carbon copy of Revelation 19. And we see something else that parallels this, and that's why I want to bring that, that point up. If we go to chapter 24, just to get some context here, because we read these verses yesterday. Uh, chapter 24, verse 1. For behold, the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste, distorts its surface and scatters the inhabitants abroad. This is talking about the same thing, um, the same thing when Yeshua returns. This is what it's uh, demonstrating here. And then I just want to jump up um, to verse 6. It says, therefore, the curse has devoured the earth. And we're going to see in the book of uh, Revelation that the curse is not actually removed from the earth until after the millennium. Very, very important. Because with this curse that Yeshua brings, and we've been reading about that curse in all these verses, the earth will not be able to support life. The curse is not removed until we get to chapter 22 in the book of Revelation after the thousand years. There's no way this earth can support life. 
Then it goes on to say in verse 6, And those who dwell in it are desolate. Same thing we've been reading. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned. Same thing we've been reading. And few men are left. And we talked about yesterday, who are the few men? People say, well, there's going to be people alive. Yes, there will be people alive. There will be people standing, as Revelation chapter 6 tells us. The answer to the question, who is able to stand? Those few men that are left here, you could say that they're the remnant. They're the ones that are left able to face the one that sits on the throne and be able to stand. Those are indeed the 144,000 that are left. They're the only ones that will survive the second coming in the time of the end. Then those that have died in Christ will be raised up, and then they will go to the Father's house at that point. So it goes here and explains it a little further, but we want to jump up to verse 19 for the sake of time. At the second coming, it goes on to say, the earth is violently broken, and the earth is split open, and the earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall totter like a hut. Here again, the point being is you've got the most powerful mass, or powerful, most powerful agency, which is the Son of God himself, that breathes worlds into existence, showing up on this planet, you want to believe that this earth will be ripped apart. And that's exactly what we see in Isaiah here, at that coming. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish on high the host of the exalted ones. Who's that? That's, that's got to be Satan and his angels. What's he going to do? He's going to punish them on that day. We see this in the book of Revelation. There's a description of that punishment. It says that this mighty angel comes down and puts a chain on Satan. What does he do? He's locked up for that thousand years. It goes on to say that he and on earth the kings of the earth. Who are the kings of the earth? They're the ones that we read about in Revelation. These are the ones, the beast system, and the false prophet. But, but Isaiah did not see all of that picture. Do you understand now why we've got to go to the later prophets to see and understand what these guys were writing about? They didn't have the details, and that's why it's so important that we can't make these guys the final word. We're going to see that even more. It says here, on earth, the kings of the earth... They will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit. These are the ones that are alive when Yeshua comes back. And will be shut up in the prison. And after many days, they will be punished. What is going on here? Well, I would like to propose that the many days there that I did, Isaiah didn't see or didn't explain is a thousand year period. We see this in the book of Daniel, where he's told to shut up the words and seal the book. And after many days, we see this same expression. Well, the fulfillment of those many days, in Daniel's case, was nearly 2,500 years. So the terminology of many days could easily be suggesting that if we go to the book of Revelation, we see exactly how long those many days are. So what happens at the second coming, the wicked are destroyed. They're in the prison house of death, unconsciousness. And then we get to the end of the millennium, and we're going to see that they rise and are loosed from their prison house. And of course, in Revelation, it talks about then Satan goes out to deceive those that have risen. And that's what we're looking at. That's the rest of the story that uh, is in the book of Revelation. And they will be gathered as prisoners are gathered in the pit, and we've shut up in the prison, and after many days they will be punished. And then it says, Then the moon will be disgraced, and the sun ashamed, for the Lord, Jehovah of hosts, will reign on Mount Zion, 
and in Jerusalem before his elders. This is just beautiful. Okay, so let's get the picture here. So we've got Yeshua returning. The earth is in complete chaos, to and fro, rocking, being ripped apart. Those people are punished. They're destroyed. We've seen that very clearly. After many days, they're brought out and punished. That's what it says, and we know that. We see that in the book of Revelation. It's called the second death that they receive. And then it says, then the Lord of hosts will reign in Jerusalem. Well, it doesn't say the new Jerusalem, but if we follow the logic here, we can see that the, in the city, the new Jerusalem, has come down out of heaven, and God has made his throne here on this planet, and that is exactly what it's talking about. Mount Zion, the heavenly Mount Zion, and the heavenly Jerusalem will come down. We see this picture, and this is what it's saying here. But we don't see the picture of the holy city, the heavenly Jerusalem, coming down in the book of Isaiah. We've got to go to Revelation to see that. So if we're thinking that this Mount Zion is at the beginning of the millennium, that's, that's not the way the story goes. And so we've got to put these prophecies where they belong. And I say again, we've got to rightly divide the word of truth. If you have to rightly divide the word of truth, there's got to be the possibility to incorrectly divide the word of truth. And that's certainly what we don't want to do. We need all the information here that we're looking at. So let's move on, shall we? And let's go back to Revelation. Revelation 21 to 3. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, the, old ser the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. This is, the, this is the culmination of this event. So we've got a thousand year period now that Satan is bound here on the earth. Well, Satan's in, he's actually in business. Uh, right now, and his evil angels are in business right now. What would they do on a planet if he's locked down here? Because we know, one thing we know for sure, is he is alive and well here in the time of the end. He, at this time in Earth's history, at this time in Earth's history, it says that he's been cast to the earth. So when Yeshua comes back, Satan is right here. He's on the earth. The earth has been reduced to basically a bottomless pit without form and void. Satan is locked up here. Why is he locked up here? He's locked up due to circumstances that are outside of his control. There is no one on this planet left alive. The righteous have been taken up into a cloud and meet the Lord in the air. And those that have died in Yeshua meet the Lord in the air, and they are gone. They are gone to the Father's house to celebrate their victory. Satan and his angels are left here on this planet with no one alive. They are bound here with a great chain. The chain is a chain of circumstances, if you will, is that God no longer allows Satan to go anywhere in this universe. He is on lockdown. He has been cast to the earth, never more to go anywhere. And so he is basically out of business. And uh, that he's bound by this chain of circumstances, and he cannot get away. God has locked him down on this planet where no life exists except him and his angels. That's what it says in Isaiah. It says he will punish the exalted ones from on high. These are Satan and his angels. They are punished. They are restricted to this planet where there is no life. They are completely out of business, the business of deceiving. He lays hold of this old serpent. He is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. This is actually the scapegoat 
of the sanctuary on the Day of Atonement that is taken out into the wilderness but is not killed. And so he is that scapegoat. And why is that so fitting? Because ultimately he is the one responsible for all, not only the destruction that goes through here, but the destruction that has come upon this planet because of sin, which he was the first instigator of that. So he gets his just reward and all those exalted ones that are with him are bound to this earth through the millennium. Think of it this way. Satan is in jail, if you will, for 1,000 years to contemplate what he and his evil agencies have done for 1,000 years. You'd think he'd come out of the other side of that repentant. And God's demonstration is that when the mind is fixed, when the mind becomes hardwired, it is impossible for it to change. Satan's mind will be impossible to change even though he's in prison for a thousand years. His evil angels' minds are never going to change even though they've been in prison for a thousand years. And when the righteous come up, they allow Satan to influence them again, to deceive them again. And were they given a hundred resurrections, the demonstration is their minds are fixed and have become hardwired to do evil and there is no changing. This is why God allows all of this to happen as a demonstration. And this tells me it is so important to take the right path because if I come, become accustomed to believing deceptions, it will become at some point in my future that I will not be able to change my course because I will be fixed in that deception. Oh, friends, it is so vital that we guard the avenues to our minds so that we are not deceived. This is what Yeshua said in the time of the end. Deception will be at an all-time high. Let's keep going, shall we? And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Well, you can't deceive people that are dead. So it's not until these people are risen that he goes out and he's loose from his prison. Why is he loose from his prison? Because now he can go back to work. That's what happens when somebody's let out of prison. They can go back to work now because they're free. Satan will become free again to do his work of deception, and that's what the Bible tells us clearly. He's going to work again as soon as he uh, has people to work with. And then it goes on to say, And I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls who had been beheaded for their witness and testimony to Yeshua, or the testimony of Yeshua, and I've emphasized this. I want to bring it out here again. It says that they are beheaded for their witness, but it actually is the same word as in the beginning of Revelation and all the way through where it talks about the testimony of Yeshua and for the word of God. That's why John was in prison, for the testimony of Yeshua, which is the spirit of prophecy, and for the word of God. We see this at least seven times through the book of Revelation. The gift that God gives his people through this time is the testimony of Yeshua, which is the spirit of prophecy, which identifies those that are doing evil. That's why the persecution of God's people at the end, because they are revealing who the evil powers are on the planet, because God gives us insight in the time of the end of who our enemies are. And our enemies are not going to like that. And some of us will be put to death. We see this in uh, John or in Revelation chapter 6. These people that were under the, the altar crying out, they were martyred, it says, 
And they were martyred for the same reason, the testimony of Yeshua, which they held on to, the testimony which they held, which is the testimony of Yeshua, which is the spirit of prophecy, and the word of God. So these are the two things that God's people in the time of the end will be in possession of, and the world does not like that because they're revealing what is going on. So these people that were witnessing or had the testimony of Yeshua, which is the spirit of prophecy, the understanding of the prophetic word and timelines, uh, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, they lived and they lived and reigned with Christ forever and ever. Is that what it says? You see, it's very interesting that God's word says that those that have died and those that have risen, uh, risen in Christ, and the 144,000, it seems to say here that they're going to reign. But it says they're going to reign with Yeshua for a thousand years. You see, there's two separate reigns in the book of Revelation. One is a forever reign, which we're going to get to, and the other one is a thousand-year reign. Why are they going to reign with Yeshua? We see glimpses of this here in the book of Revelation. And I want you to turn there because this is, this is a major point uh, that's being pushed these days that we need to understand. In the book of Revelation, chapter 4, 5, 6, 7, is another segment. It's a segment of prophecy that is isolated all on its own. It tells events that are going to happen before the second coming, and it culminates in chapter 6 and 7, culminate in the second coming. And then it demonstrates that these ones that are raised are going to go to the throne room of heaven. Well, we see in chapter 4 that there are 24 elders. You remember when we read in, I think it was in Isaiah, that it says that the elders he will reign gloriously and his elders this is what it's talking about here in the book of revelation again we see the 24 elders and it tells us that they are on 24 thrones and we're looking at that in verse um verse 4 of chapter 4 and it says and around the throne were 24 thrones and on thrones i saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. This is at a time prior to the second coming. If there are thrones around the throne of God, I would suggest that they're reigning with Yeshua at that time. That's why it says thrones. Usually if you sit on a throne, you're reigning. This is talking about thrones around the throne of God. We need to get this picture. They're reigning with the Father that is sitting on the throne, and we see the picture that the Lamb comes and takes a book from the Father, and he opens the seals. This is the opening of the seals of the book of Revelation. This is before, this is right, could even be right now uh, that this is going on. I'm not saying it is right now, but what my point is, is there are 24 elders. Where did they come from? Maybe those that were raised and Yeshua took to heaven when he ascended at his first coming. I don't know who they are. It doesn't tell us who they are, but I believe they are elders and I believe they are human beings. It would seem to indicate that. Let's go down again. And this is what they say. And it said, they sang a new song in verse 9 talking about the 24 elders, it says in verse 8, Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp of gold and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us. You see what I mean? They have been redeemed. These are human beings that have been redeemed from this earth. Out of every tribe 
tongue, and people, and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall future reign on the earth. In other words, they're reigning right now, but where are they reigning? They're reigning in heaven. They're reigning next to the throne of God. But there will come a time, and they know this, at that time that they're saying this, is there will be a time when they shall reign on the earth. Future. Why are they going to reign on the earth? Because we're going to have the holy city, the throne room of God, come down and plant itself on this earth, and that's when they will reign on earth. And that's the reigning that it's talking about here. It does not say that when Yeshua returns, that's when they're going to reign on the earth. It does not say that. That's not what this verse says in Revelation chapter 20 when we go back there. It says that they will live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. I'm going to suggest that they are going to go to the throne room. We've already seen that. We've seen that in the book of Revelation. They will become co-heirs of the kingdom of God at that time with the 24 elders, and they will reign in heaven for that thousand years. And then when the holy city comes down, we're going to see something very interesting in um, chapter 22 of Revelation verse 5. This is when they reign on the earth after the holy city comes down. Revelation 22, verse 5. And there shall be no night there. And we're going to get there. We're going to unpack this fully as we go. And there shall be no night there. They need no light nor lamp of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. You see, there's two, book, there's two reigns in the book of Revelation. One reign is prior to eternity in its fullest sense, the last great day. And there's one reign prior to that point, and that's the thousand-year reign. Why would the book of Revelation differentiate between a thousand-year reign and a forever reign? Because it's not the forever reigning on earth until the thousand years are finished. That's what it tells us in uh, Revelation. If the reigning on earth began at the beginning of the thousand years, then that would be the forever reign. Instead of saying a thousand years here, it would say, and they reigned with Christ on earth forever. That's what it should say, because that's what it says later on in the book of Revelation in chapter 22. The forever reign does not happen because it doesn't begin at the time that Yeshua returns the second time. The forever reign on earth does not happen until after the millennium. And if it did happen, it would be redundant... Or this wouldn't be said the way it says here at the second coming. It would say, and they reigned with Christ forever. But the fact is, they go to the Father's house. And that's where they begin their reign as the redeemed, just as the 24 elders are reigning there. And they will reign with them in the Father's house. Somebody might say, well, what are they going to reign over? Well, you know, I have this idea that the, the kingdom of heaven is a lot bigger than what we think. And could it be that the redeemed one of this world become ambassadors to the king of heaven? And they are his valued representatives in the whole kingdom of the universe. They have experienced something that the other beings, however many there are out there, have never experienced, and they become special representatives for the king of the universe, and they fulfill his glory. We, we don't understand 
all that's going on here. No question about it. Corinthians tells us, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge in the smallest matters? There was a problem in the Corinthians church. And uh, Paul reminds them, I would have liked to have got the fullness of this story. But he tells them that they're going to judge the world. You see, this is what's going on. During the thousand years, the books are going to be opened and we will get to see all the details of not only this and why certain people are not in the kingdom, but we're going to be able to go back to the very beginning, the very beginning of when Satan started to go against God and we're going to be able to see all those details. That's what the thousand years are all about. That's the only sense we can make of this, that the saints will judge the world. It's not that they're the final authority, but God gives them um, access to all the information. Now, we know what a jury is. A jury in court, they try and get all the information. The witnesses are brought out. Everything's brought out. But this is the court of heaven. We're going to have all the truth on all matters throughout all ages, and we will be able to judge not just those that are lost, but the primary focus of all of this is so that we can make a judgment of God. Have you ever thought of it in that way? We will be able to judge God in that is he just and righteous in all of his ways? We will be able to follow his workings all down through history and be able to see that he has done everything possible to save as many people as possible and to make as many, and Ray, you might remember where this comes from, his whole focus on this world is to make as many people as happy as possible for as long as possible, and that as long as possible would be throughout eternity. And so we're going to be able to see through this thousand-year period that he has done every possible thing to save as many possible uh, beings throughout this whole plan that is being played out, of which we are at the end of. And this is what the saints will be doing. Goes on to say, and do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? He's talking about people that should be able to make a decision on in the church. And um, he says, look, we're going to be even judging angels. Well, I would like to ask the question, why would we judge angels? Angels that excel in strength, that have intellects far beyond our intellect. Well, we might gain a little intellect through this because we will be forever made new. But the idea is what we're judging here is we're judging through that thousand years why even the angels that were lost are going to be lost forever. Why is this important? Because when, we're, when, they are, when the evil people are resurrected in the time of the end and destruction comes upon them, we will have our minds made up that there is nothing God could do further to save not only man that has rejected him, but the angels as well. And we're gonna, that's going to be so clear at the end of the millennium that when it all has to happen, we're going to understand why it actually has to happen. Let's move on. And if then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? So the idea here, I find this interesting in the light of what we're talking about. Paul says, okay, so if you're going to have a problem in the church, are you going to appoint those that are least esteemed in the church? He's not belittling those that are least in the church. But he's suggesting here 
that there should be somebody that's wise that is appointed to do the judging in the church. Maybe an elder. How about that? Maybe an elder in the church. We are going to be numbered among the elders of God's multifaceted church, his universal church, and we are going to be asked to be part of his jury pool, if you will, and determine whether the right, whether those that have gone before us that have died and chosen evil, and whether the evil angels who have chosen to go against God, we are going to be able to judge to say whether they are worthy of the death, the second death, which they will experience at, after the millennium. Revelation 20, verse 5, But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Well, it's not the first resurrection. But we could put this, tag it into, and there again, not only chapters are not part of the, the actual writings, and verses are not part of. We divided them up. So you could actually put this in parenthesis, talking about those that were raised, those that were beheaded, the verse that has gone before this, and then put in parentheses, but the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. End of parentheses. This is the first resurrection. The first resurrection is the resurrection of the righteous. Very clear here as well. Blessed and holy is he who is part in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power, but they, have been, uh, they shall be priests of God and of Yeshua and shall reign with him a thousand years here again. Uh, they are now in the throne room of heaven, and they will reign with him for a thousand years in that throne room. At the end of the millennium, they will come down inside the city, and at that point, when God makes everything new, they will reign on earth forever and ever, exactly what it says. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. Why? Because the rest of the dead now are alive. That's just what we read at the end of the thousand years. He is now released. He's back in business, allowed to do his work of deception. Why does God do this? The reason why he does this, the only sense I can make, is it's a demonstration that no matter how many times they are resurrected, they will fall prey to Satan's deception. Why? Because their minds have now become hardwired against God and they will never choose the right. Even if God raises them again, that's why it says this after the second death, there is no power. There's no power of resurrection after the second death because the demonstration that they will always choose evil instead of good has been demonstrated and there is no resurrection. It's not that God couldn't resurrect them from the second death. It's that he will not resurrection, uh, will not resurrect them after the second death because there's no value or point to it. Do we need to go through this any longer after all of this? God's not, he's going to bring an end of suffering at some point, and that's not going to happen until after the millennium. So Satan is released and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. So this is the battle of Gog and Magog, and somebody says, well, that's what is that, Ezekiel? Well, ultimately, there will be a Gog and Magog battle. There will only be one Gog and Magog battle, and it is not until after the millennium, and we see the details of that um, in the book of Revelation. Whose number be as the sand of the sea. Get the picture. So all the wicked of all ages are rise at that time in earth's history, and they are numbered as the sand of the sea. He goes out to deceive the nations. What is he going out to deceive the nations? We know the end from the beginning. The same lie that he shared with the evil angels who became evil angels after he started sharing things with them. It's the same lie that he said to Adam and Eve, Eve in the garden, is you shall not surely die. 
Now, if we go back to the Garden of Eden, God had made this tree and that it said that they would eat from the tree of life and they would live forever. We know that he barred them from the tree of life so they wouldn't continue in sin and still be allowed forever. You see, the idea is, is that God would never bring a destruction on the evil angels and the wicked because he is love. This is the, this is the lie that Satan has told down through the ages is you can have your sin and have eternal life too, but because God loves you so much, you will always live forever. Well, this could not be farther from the truth, but this is the truth that the whole world has bought into. I believe that's the same truth that the evil angels bought into, is God would never allow us to be destroyed because he loves us too much. That's the lie of Satan. The reality of it is we see the end of the story in the book of Revelation, and they will be brought to nothing upon the earth. No question about it. Satan goes out to deceive the nations about what? Well, it's the same lie. You can actually live forever. So what do they do? We see exactly what they do. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints, the beloved city, the heavenly Jerusalem. I put that in there. That's what it is because it has come down on the earth and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Here it is, the rest of the story right here. That's the end of that story. And so this is what happens in the final eradication, if you will, of all sin and sinners, including Satan and his angels. This is what we see. What are they surrounding the city? The only reason why they're surrounding the city is because General Lucifer knows that the tree of life is inside that city. If all these unrighteous people, all these wicked people could get into the city, they could have the tree of life, access to the tree of life, and they would be able to live forever. You see, it's living forever is what people want. The trouble with the wicked is they have believed the lie that you can go against God's word, that's what Eve did, go against the plain word of God and still have life eternally. And this is the lie that Satan has given right from the very beginning of his apostasy, his separation from God. This is the same lie he used on the evil angels. This is the same lie that he's used on human beings all through the ages. This is the same lie that he finishes up on, and that's why they surround the city. Think of it this way. The city takes up a pretty large area. We can see that in the book of Revelation. But there's a whole world out there. Why did they come up to the city? It's so they gain access to the tree of life because they know that they are still mortal beings. The devil who deceived them was cast alive into the lake of fire or brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was no place found for them. Who? The wicked. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened, another book was opened, and the, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which are, were written in the books. So here we see the ultimate judgment of all flesh. And we saw, Paul says that God has appointed a day in which he will judge not the church, but the world in righteousness. This is found in Acts chapter 27. This is the, the view that he saw here. Now, I have to ask the question, did Paul understand that to be in his day 3,000 years down the road? I doubt it. I doubt that he saw that. But he knew there would be a day. And that's just like all the prophets have gone before. They haven't seen the timing of the events portrayed in the prophecies. They've seen the events. 
And this is what Paul saw here. He saw this day when the whole world would be standing before God. He has summoned them, basically, up to the New Jerusalem. And that is the place where they will be judged. This is the ultimate day of atonement. This is the fulfillment now of the fall festival. So this tells me that this is in the fall. That's when judgment day is. It's in the fall. Revelation 20, 13 goes on to say, And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast alive into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And then it says here, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. You see, here's another problem. Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, is actually part of Revelation 20, verse 15, and the verses have gone before that. You say, well, why do you say that? Well, number one, as I repeat again, is that there's segments of the book of Revelation where we have a story. And then we jump to the next segment and we have a, an enlargement of what's gone before. And that's what we have starting in verse 2. Starting in verse 2 is an enlargement of how we got to the destruction of all the wicked. And we're going to see in this verse, these verses that follow, it's going to recap some of the things that have just gone before. Well, that tells us this is a repeat and enlargement portion of what has gone before. People say, well, the holy city was already on the earth uh, when Yeshua came back. Well, no, it wasn't. He brings it with him um, after the thousand years. And that's in the book of, uh, book of Jude when it says that the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones. This is now at the third coming, after the millennium, when the holy city is coming down out of heaven. All of the redeemed are inside the city, and that's what uh, Enoch prophesied. Uh, that's what it tells us in the book of Jude, that Enoch prophesied. Enoch saw the very end of the story and the final judgment and the destruction of the wicked. That's what he's talking about in those verses in the book of Jude. So we see here the end of this story. So we see that at the end of the millennium, uh, the wicked are raised, Satan's left out in his prison, Satan goes out to deceive the nations, then we go to judgment, and after judgment, he sees a new heaven and a new earth. That's the big picture. Now let's look at some detail. Then he's going to tell us all that happened to get us to a new heaven and a new earth. John says in verse 20, in chapter 20, verse 2, then I, John, or then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. This has already happened, and I'm going to prove that. People say, oh no, well, this is all going to happen after what we just read. No, no. This is an enlargement on what city the wicked came up and encompassed. It was the New Jerusalem. But it did, they didn't do that until the new Jerusalem came down out of heaven. Now think of it this way. The wicked are raised at the end of the millennium. And they see the new Jerusalem come down. Do you think that that city would be visible? Well, you want to look at the description of the city and how big it is. Absolutely, it's going to be visible to all those that are raised, all those wicked that are raised on the earth. The reason why they come up and surround the city is because Satan's explained to them, that's the deception, that if we go up, I know where that city's going to be, everyone follow me, if we go up and surround that city and take it, we can get access to the tree of life and we can all live 
forever. They buy into it because they see the city come down and they know it's there. This is what happens. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. If we look at Ezekiel 36, 26 and 20 to 28, those are those verses where it says, I will put a new spirit within you, cause you to walk in, your, in my statutes and judgments and do them. But verse 28 says something very interesting. It gives the rest of the story. It says, then I will be their God. You see, technically, it's not until this time that God dwells with his people after the millennium. This is when the throne of the Lamb is said to be inside this city. Uh, obviously, if the throne of the Lamb and the throne of the Father are inside the city and it doesn't come down till after the millennium, then Yeshua has not been reigning on this earth. He's been reigning on his throne in the kingdom of his Father. It will be at this time. It will be at this time, Matthew 6, 9 and 10. I want to look at that. This is the gospel promise when Andrew asked Yeshua, teach us to pray. Everyone knows what, what he said. But these two verses, our Father in heaven, hallowed holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It will not be fulfilled. The Father's kingdom does not come to this earth until, according to John, after the millennium. Yeshua told us to pray this prayer. Very interesting. We are asking God to come with his kingdom and reign forever and ever on this earth. The idea is, is that is our goal to be in the kingdom of God. But it does not come, according to the book of Revelation, until the holy city comes down. And that does not happen until after the millennium. And it's not going to be till after the millennium and the annihilation or the destruction of the wicked that God's will will be done by all those who are left. It will be at that time that God will wipe away Every tear from their eyes, there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away when God dwells with us. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Very important. It isn't until after the millennium that God makes all things new. It's going to be absolutely necessary because this earth has been reduced to utter chaos and it won't be until after the wicked are destroyed and um, everything has been gotten rid of, everything evil has been destroyed, that God will make all things new. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. This is another interesting thing here. At the Feast of Tabernacles, Yeshua declared himself to be the water of life, and he would give it freely. This is not accomplished he declared this at the Feast of Tabernacles. So this is all coming down to the ultimate Feast of Tabernacles when he is the living water and it proceeds from the throne. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire which burn or lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. This is what I said. This is the repeat and enlargement. When the holy city comes down, God says, I'm going to make all things new. And then he says, those that have not be a part of my system, and he explains who they are, they will receive the second death. 
It hasn't happened yet in this segment of the book of Revelation because it is a repeat and enlarge. How did we get here? How did we get to the destruction of the wicked? This is how we got here. The holy city came down. They surrounded the city. God declares he's going to make all things new. Uh, but those that are outside, which we're going to see, are going to have their part in the uh, destruction. Revelation 21, 9 through 12, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me and said, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem. What is happening here? Descending. Okay, so didn't we just see that already? It descended. So is God going to have this city come down? Then he's going to take it up again. Then it's going to come down. This is a repeat, another repeat and enlargement. This is how we got to the destruction of the wicked. He's doing a rewind and he's filling in more gaps here. It's the only reasonable conclusion. He's not going to take the city up and down again. So he's being shown now the city coming down. This is what I was explaining earlier. The wicked are going to see this picture because they're going to be resurrected to see the city coming down. That's why they surround the city because they know it's there. It says he carried me away in the city and he showed me a great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Then having the glory of God, her light was like the precious, most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also, she had a great high wall and 12 gates and 12 angels at, it, at the gates and the names written on them, which were the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Very interesting here. I'm not going to go through the description of the city, but I'm sure you've done that before. It also had a foundation of all these stones and glittering stones and had this tremendous light from God emanate from this. Can you imagine what this would have looked like or what this will look like? The wicked are going to see this and that's why they're going to go up to the city because Satan has deceived them to think that they could rule within that city if they got access to the tree of life. And of course, the numbers of those that are outside the city is far greater than those that are inside. And this is what the picture that's being developed here. And of course, if you're not of the 12 tribes of Israel, if you haven't been grafted into the house of Israel, the overcomers, if you will, those that have overcome or got the victory over the evil one, those are the only ones that are allowed into the city, and they have been adopted. If you are Christ, you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. This is the ultimate promise of God when the kingdom is restored to Israel. That's the question that the disciples asked. Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? It is at this time. It is not at the second coming. It is at the third coming after the thousand years when the kingdom is restored to Israel. We see that Revelation 21, 22 to 26. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. We are actually at that point not in need of a temple because the purpose of the temple has, has been gone. But we are living in the Father and we are living in in the Son, and they are in us as the Son was in the Father. This is the ultimate promise of unity within the household of faith. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in, for the glory of God illuminated, and the Lamb is its light. Interesting, John says this because he says in John chapter 1, that Yeshua is the light that lights every man that comes into the world. Is, the, is Yeshua qualified 
to be our judge? Absolutely, because he has lived at least for a time in every man that has come into the world through their conscience. He has spoken to them through their conscience, and he knows whether they are his or not. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in the light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. Parenthesis it says, and there shall be no night there. I can't wait. I get tired during the day, uh, during the day and then I go to sleep at night. Sometimes I roll around in bed and not sleep. We're not going to have to worry about having beds there because there's going to be no night there. Why is that? Because we're not going to get tired. They shall mount up on eagle's wings and will not faint. Those are the ultimate promises of God that I am so looking forward to. They shall bring their glory and honor of the nations into that, into it, into the holy city. But there shall be no means enter it anything that defiles or causes the abomination or lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. In other words, evil is never going to get into this city. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne and of the Lamb. In the middle of the street on either side of the river was the tree of life that bore 12, uh, 12 fruits, each yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of nations. You know, we all like to share a meal with each other, but this will be the ultimate meal. I believe, you know, uh, our minds can't conceive the good that God has for us, but for some reason, this tree of life, it seems that every month, Every new moon, we come and partake of the tree of life that enables us to live forever. And God is going to have a surprise fruit every month throughout eternity on this tree of life. That's unreal. We will always be looking forward to what surprise God has for us on the new moon. And there should be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him. This is the first time that the curse of the second coming, the curse that comes with the destruction through this time, it says that in Isaiah, we read that, that the curse devours the earth. Malachi, it says, unless you remember the law of Moses, my servant, that I commanded him Horab, unless the curse comes and devours the earth, this is what we see here at the second coming. The curse actually devours the earth and it is not let loose from this curse until after the millennium. So in the middle of the street on either side of the river was a tree of life which bore 12 manners of fruits, each yielding its fruit every month. And then this is when there's no more curse. Without the removal of the curse, after the millennium, the earth will not support life. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there, no need of lamp or light uh, of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. It's not until the restoration of all things and the earth is made new that the declaration is that they shall reign forever and ever. The two reigns of Revelation are two distinct reigns. One is when God takes us to his throne room in heaven. The other is after we come down and we reign on earth forever and ever. And like I said earlier, that's the ultimate fulfillment of the Jubilee when the land is given back to its original owners and the meek shall inherit the earth. Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angels to show his servants things which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of this prophecy. Jumping down to Revelation 20, verse 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments, 
that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates of the city. The opposite could be said here. Those that do not do his commandments have no right to the tree of life. You see, this is the deception of Satan, is we can get into the city and we can get in possession of the tree of life and you can live forever. God says that you have no right to the tree of life. In other words, you are not going to live forever because you haven't understood. It's not about legalism, but they haven't understood that God's way is the only way to true happiness and his commandments are his way of our happiness. And those righteous understand that and they have submitted to his righteousness, which is contained in his law, so that they can ultimately be the happiest people for the longest period as possible, that being eternity. But outside, another repeat and enlargement, when they're all inside the city, outside are dogs, sorcerers, sexual immoral, murderers and idolaters, whoever loves and practices a lie. They have accepted the lie from the beginning is that they can live forever in their sin. What does it say Paul says in, in Thessalonians chapter, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, I believe it is, where it says that God gives them over to strong delusion because they love not the truth, but believed the lie. This is what happens here. I, Yeshua, have sent my angel to testify to you the things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Then he who sat, who sat on the throne, behold, I make all things new. After the destruction of the wicked, God makes all things new. The ultimate fulfillment of the plan of salvation in the Feast of Tabernacles, when God supplies our living dwellings out of the furnishings that he places on the earth, the living trees, and all the things that he provides for us. And this is what the Feast of Tabernacles was. They were commanded to go out into the wilderness and make, it, make a house, not chop down trees and put them through a mill and build a house, they were told to bring living things and make dwellings for themselves. This is the ultimate fulfillment when God makes all things new and we have living green houses because all the, the problems of this life have, have passed away. We're not going to have winter coats anymore. We're not going to have fences. We're not going to have locks. But we're going to have houses of living green and we will be able to partake of all of it because there shall be no more curse but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face and, the, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun for the Lord God gives them light and they shall reign forever and ever. It's like on the last great day, the eighth day, the eight has been turned sideways and we enter into the forever land of eternity. Wonderful concept. If that's not the gospel, I don't know what is. The plan of salvation as revealed in the festival calendar and the events connected to the festival calendar, which is the plan of salvation, are clearly portrayed in the prophecies. Well, we've come to the end of another feast and another teaching. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your plan that you have invited us to be a part of. And Father, we pray again that you would finish the work that you have started in us so that we can be a part of this magnificent, glorious kingdom that you are even preparing as we speak. 
We thank you so much. We ask these things in Yeshua's name. Amen.